Hello, welcome. So the introduction seems to be German, so I will translate into English, of course. Hello, welcome to the Lightning Talks. There are still open spots. So in the wiki, there's the gratitude exchange, and you can write in whatever you're grateful for. And that will be read out later. Other than that, the speakers will just be um, without sound, so they'll be muted and without picture as long as it's not their turn. And looking forward to the talks. And there is a question pad, of course, linked in the wiki. Yeah, looking forward to the talks. And hopefully you do as well. We'll start with Moritz and the Chaos Sticker Collection. Hello, Moritz. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ben. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm just sharing my slides. So, are the slides visible? No slides yet. Uh, yes, there they are. Okay. Now we can see them. Hi, I am Moritz. I want to talk to you about a small project of mine. And it seems like we lost connection there. Hello, Ben. So, due to technical difficulties, apparently a bad internet connection, I would suggest that we just skip to the next talk. Moritz reboots his connection and we try again afterwards. So, that would be teas with Copycore and Pop Culture. So, hello, I want to talk to two problems from the perspective of musicians where I see need to find appropriate solutions and I am looking for people helping me developing those solutions. So, I would like allies. And again, we are fighting with um, slight technical difficulties. Yeah, okay, we had to end the screen share there. Can you see me now? Yes, now we can see you. Should I start again? Okay, let, let's start again. So today I wanna, I would like to talk about two problem areas from the perspective of musicians. And I am looking for solutions that are appropriate for the digital area uh, era. And I'm looking for allies. The one problem area that I can see at least is copyright. 
dass sich im Verlauf des 20. Jahrhunderts zu einer And during the 20th century it developed uh, sorry, I didn't quite get that, but it developed badly, I would assume. To insert a little bit, I want to talk about the history during, uh, that happened during the 20th century. Up until 1920s, music was hardly protected, but that changed with the industrial revolution and when it was possible to use machines to distribute both the notes and the papers and printing, but also automated pianos. And during the first three decades of the 20th century, up until the 1960s, the run times for musical properties were rather short and you had to register for your work to be protected. And after that it was freely available and also if nobody registered it, it was freely available. From the 70s, in most industrial nations, there are there are um, slightly differing rules between the countries but it's mostly around 70 years after the death of the author and that is quite a long time. So the author can use their work as they see fit until their death and also those who inherit those rights should profit from it. But after that, I think it's quite problematic. And of course, the distributors and those who use those rights, who are not composers or artists themselves, they profit largely. And of course, we could shorten the times, but maybe that's not even the most difficult part of it. Before the digitization, a lot of things were forgotten and um, music got lost. And of course, there was new music that got influenced and back then it was normal. Nobody knew where some idea came from and what belonged to who and what could be copyrighted or what could be in the public domain because people forgot about things. Today it's quite different. Everything is available and everything is yeah, present for people and at the same time as much music as never before is created, which is good, but with the run times of the copyright, everything that is possible, everything imaginable will at some point be copyrighted. Technically, that's already the case. There is a lawyer and musician who 2020 went ahead and just created algorithmically everything that you could imagine. And there's also a TED talk about this. And I will post a link to this in the pad. And since then, technically, everything that you can imagine is copyrighted. The second area I want to talk about it uh, about is the practice of streaming. So 90% of the money made is made by streaming. Most platforms uh, use a per rate system. So everything is collected and depending on how many streams in total you had, you will earn a lot. And who already earns a lot gets more and who is listened to the least gets less. That's similar to the when you are at the music shop and you're the price is depending on how often something was bought. Well, not the price per se, but how much money the artist gets. So it could be diff uh, different. It could depend on how much the listener is really listening to. If I am only listening to one artist, then this artist gets all my money for the month. But of course, there are shareholder interests that are against this. And there are four big uh, multimedia companies who 
really have other interests as well. And big lobby uh, alliances who have interests and that circles back to copyright and they try to keep this running, this system. And a lot of things that are established already, they try to give them further reach. There is political will for reform. And in Britain, there is parliamentary uh, action happening. But of course, the politicians don't really know what they're talking about, so it's troublesome. My question for the community, what are your ideas to handle this? Would it be possible to have different platforms, to develop platforms yourselves or ourselves that are more fair? And how could an open source principle for this look like? Whoever would like to participate in thinking about this can Feel free to contact me, and that's basically it. Thank you. Great. Uh, perhaps you also want to write into the pad or the wiki how you can be reached if people want to contact you? Yes. And also put your link in there. Great. Das Pad ist auch im Wiki verlinkt. Das Pad ist auch im Wiki verlinkt. The Pad is also linked in the Wiki, where you can ask questions. Genau. Ich sehe jetzt Great. keine Fragen im Pad. Antis von der See no questions in the Pad, so let's continue with the next talk: Search Engine Archaeology. Hey, Uhu. Hello, welcome to my presentation. I hope you can hear me. I'll show my screen. So we will talk about the archaeology of search engine, uh, about me. I, it's a small hobby. Um, you can reach me with this email address, and I'm member of a uh, uh, of the real ROM hackerspace. So first of all, um, there are two words: search machine archaeology. A search engine is a program used to find documents on a computer or a computer network. Documents are general. It's not only about HTML, but we want to find documents overall. The question is, how can we find uh, documents? For example, uh, we are looking for a fish that's not uh, and, and that's north in the UK, and here there should be a QR code. Here is the QR code. Um, anyways, it should be in the slides. You can find it later. And we formulate a search. And the first is fish. The quotes mean that it's it's exactly the word and then we search uh, for the northern UK. Those quotes are very important because otherwise northern Europe and southern UK would also match. And Northern UK or Scottish and we might either use the pipe or the or and races like in mathematics and then we say we don't want salmon uh, in this case we use the minus and uh, it's commonly used to reduce wordpress and, or perhaps you have an annoying search result you want to re remove and then we say we want to use wikipedia if you search it you will not find northern fish but um, you Position who is shot scotch because only because you are able to write a good search query does not mean you will find a good result so let's continue to archaeology uh, the english wikipedia uh, says it's the the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture. It's not about the analy analysis, but it's but, but finding the, 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 
die Items. Search Manager in Archaeology is if we use Search Engine to find digital culture. A well-known example is Minecraft, and perhaps you have run Minecraft or played Minecraft, you could write that into the IRC, and a Minecraft server has document config files, whitelists, band players, and operators, and that knowledge can be used to search for Minecraft servers. We can go to to Google and then find Minecraft and we are looking for op.txt or JSON and we require the, the title that there is index of. That way we find auto indexes. And now we have a list of Minecraft servers that are publicly available and now we could go here and download know the world and perhaps look at player data where are the enemies which equipment is used or we don't know the map and play there because it's fun and that way we can find a number of different things and the large limit is the, the own creativity rather than the search engine thank you Ja, vielen Dank für deinen Vortrag. Es gibt tatsächlich Fragen, und zwar behauptet der Vortrag... There are questions. Um, the, um, uh, is there just one search engine or multiple? Sometimes it works in others. It works best with Google, but yeah, I tried to search with different search engines, but I got significantly worse results, which is quite sad. Yeah, what's about search engine outside of Google? Thank you very much for your talk, and you left contact data. If people want to have further information, they can contact you. And I'll also write them into the pad. Thank you. All right, then the next talk is licensed by Better Lars. Hi, I'm Better Lars. Um, I would like to rant about, in this lightning talk, I would like to rant about that licenses are no use to anyone. So, we have a legal situation where everything that is artistically created is something that, in theory, only I am allowed to use. And uh, only I and my heirs are allowed to use it because the copyright protection lasts until a point much after I have stopped existing in this universe. And that I just find completely inappropriate in the general sense already. And we urgently need a reform there that somehow uh, reflects what we have in pop culture in, in meme culture and does that just does that justice because the way it's implemented at the moment well i as a small creator will not be able to enforce it anyway and that is only of help to monopolies that have the might to push through regulations that even, or copyright for projects that even in the American sphere would be classified as fair use. Um, but what may, many people don't realize is that Creative Commons has its problems too. Creative Commons has many different licenses where I can state in what way I allow my works to be used. I can use CC0, which is close to public domain in the US sense. And 
I can stipulate that people tell that I was the creator. I can stipulate that it should not be commercial. And, and many people forget uh, that if they use a work, they should link to the license as well. That is part of the conditions too. What I also find disturbing is that I can't say in Creative Commons, yes, you may use it, but you have to be excellent somehow. I want my works to be used. So I cannot say that you have to be excellent, but I don't want my works to be used in political ways that I don't agree with. And there is no really good free license for that. And thinking up new licenses is is not a good idea either. But the most brazen thing that really gets my back up is trademarks. I can't, I'm not allowed to write a story about the Little Prince. Although the Little Prince has entered the public domain a few years ago, the issue is trademark. So after copyright has expired, works can still be protected by trademark rights and then become effectively unusable. And that's just an incredible offense. I have no good way of solving that, and I just wanted to vent about that and create some awareness of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the rant. There were no questions about that, but maybe you can enter into the pad how to reach you, how you can be reached, and maybe you can get together. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to do that, although I have to deal with real life recordings right now. Uh, you can reach me under mastodon at case.social. Um, just ping better Lars. Yeah, thank you very much. Next, there is Mike with Sorbet. Cellmate, sorry. Yeah, I can tell something about Soulmate. Soulmate is a small project I started last year. And I just want to tell a little bit about it. So what is it? It is a IoT BDSM gadget. And the combination is weird already. Uh, it comes from China. The user... So it's more a gadget in the toy. So the top can decide on things and the bottom or the, the sub what they can or cannot do. And um, without violence you cannot escape it. The infrastructure, and I was looking at the app mostly, uh, on iPhone, and there is an API, and that's on a very old Apache Tomcat. The MySQL server is reachable from the outside. I, we found an admin interface. It needed a login. But what I was using via the API was completely open, and you didn't need anything to do something. And it was uh, just as bad was the API that the app is using, and we'll have a look at this in a, a more close look. So after logging in, you got a member code. That's just Unix timestamps up to the millisecond from your registration, but there was no token for authorization. And to interact with other members, you needed their member code. So when you were logged in and looked at your friend, you could also interact in their name. So, the localization was another bad point. We could see who everyone who was using the app is living. We had, I think, the top 1000 from the system. So, it has 15 to 20,000 users. And we had quite a high uh, definition from, uh, for where the people are. And we could also look for in what area they are and how much are they moving. 
Oh no, we could it definitely search for an area, so get all the users in a certain area. And this was also collected if the user disagreed on data collection. One of the worst mistakes was the password. It was uh, collected in clear text. It was mostly returned only encrypted, but in two endpoints it was even returned in clear text. So I could check the passwords from other people. I was getting passwords, I was getting email addresses, I was getting everything. And they did everything wrong they could have done wrong. And after contacting them for the first time, they removed it from one of the endpoints, but the other one still provided it. So on the 17th of May, we worked together with Internet of Dong. Uh, the producers of the sex toy, and we were talking to them, emails, but then there was nothing. Then in June they uh, closed the API, but on Twitter we um, by accident noticed that other pentesters are also on this. So in September we were coordinating with those and in October we were publishing our research. I am linking it in the, in the pad because it's very interesting to read. And in the end, it really got published in the BBC even. So BBC, The Guardian, Heise, CNN, a lot of big media. And people really noticed this. And then Black Hats got onto, on the case and started uh, attacking people and only then did the producer react. Hold uh, attack uh, users that got under attack and deactivated the holder function so everyone can open the cage. And now there is an open, a new app and it actually was pen tested properly. And that's basically it. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um, yeah, schön. thank you very much. Very nice. Do you maybe want to link to your blog entry as well? Yes, I will. Great. Other than that, there are no new questions. Thank you very much. Now we have a special honor. I'm allowed to read the gratitude. Other people thought about this, but I was asked to read them. And now I read them. I'm grateful that Linda von Brainbüdel created a great merge and we had so little work. Thank you, Linda. I thank Benjamin to, for the creating of the pets of, for the organization. Thank you. I thank Piku for the great museum tour. I'm grateful that there are these grateful that give up their free time to create this great event the walk i know who you are and you know and i know what you do and um, thank you for f and Adolfo who prepared the video streaming and ed put a lot of work into it i'm grateful for the hexen who uh, and uh, who, who helped this event to ensure that ma more people are feeling welcome. I'm th grateful for the awareness team that create, makes great work and so far I never had to contact them. I'm grateful for STB who did a lot of work for nearly everything on the event and how much time he spent to make ensure that everything is helpful. I'm grateful for Mr. Capture to create that many meeting places in the wiki. Thank you for Emilia, who found the code names game and participated at the beatbox workshop. Uh, sorry for mispronunciation of names. Thank you for the large amount of talks in the main program. 
and I got in touch with subjects I'm not, uh, what's interest, uh, I, I never met before. Thank you very much for the Hexen and their inspiration and their queer program. Christina, especially for the great talks. Thank you, Christina and Julia. Uh, uh, thank you for Sandra and Olia for their great heralding. And I'm grateful for the cement and moderation for the Rico talk. And I did not figure, do not know who you were. I like the names of the hexes. Thank you for everybody who created these great maps. Thank you for Starpeak for the Easter eggs. Thank you for the world. Thank you for the far plan. Thank you for the people who welcomed me in every session. Thank you for Dikira for the integrative. Actions. Dear community, despite us all being so tired, it worked again. The small Thank you for all those who created all the small, small items that made the world effect, uh, unique for the community. Thank you, Kuken. Thank you, Hasen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the community who all are part of those who create a contra image to the world outside where so much goes wrong. We hope that we can take the energy we experience here to update the world outside. The community as a refuge, but also as a place to get energy to move the world outside ahead. Thank you for the opportunities that to, to move in unknown areas and learn from one another. In the CCC, there are so many inspiration sources that are visible in events like these. Thank you for Telegnome for all the small, thousand small and large things. Thank you for all the beings who we don't notice, but who fix all the small bugs here and there. Thank you everybody for the sessions and the uh, relaxed acceptance for, of new people. Thank you for the Hexen who m m announced all the program on Mastodon. Thank you for everybody in the stream for watching. Without an interested audience, everything would be quite boring. Thank you for the logo generator. Thank you for all the delivery item, uh, drivers who did not participate in the event, but still gave us something, delivered us something to eat. Thank you for this new event that brought us great time. Thank you for the OBS introduction. Now I also have a flying rocket and the image and discovered a great new tool to work with. Next challenge, the deep deck sub from Pecto and Bambi for the next event. It works. Thanks for the team of C3 Lingo to make this event available for foreigners. Thank you for everybody who participated and helped that this and future. Events exist. So, thank you for listening and hopefully Boris is ready with his internet and can talk about the KO sticker collection. Hello Ben, can you Hi, hear me? Ben, can you listen? I can hear you, great. Okay, I'm going to try now, but uh, I opened the trio talk now. Should I have that one now? Because I have the honor of giving two talks, two lighting talks here, I do too much. So can you see my screen now? Can you see my slides? Yes, I see your slide. Great. Okay, I'll start then. 
Well, welcome. First of all, I'm Moritz, and I have a small open source story to tell, which is called Trigger. You can see with these locks, uh, I kind of signify what I'm going to talk about. It's not Cellmate, but something different. Um, it started with Open Lab in Augsburg, which is a hacker space, a hack space that I like a lot. and. We had an app there to open doors, such as many other hackspaces have an Android app with a big button that you could click on, and then a link was simply uh, accessed using a token. And in the meantime, I moved away. I'm in Berlin right now, and I, um, I use a co-working space there a lot. There are three physical locks. Uh, through keys, I'm sorry, and replicating those keys for everyone that comes and goes is quite an effort. People, things get lost, so it's not that simple. So I thought, hey, we have this app, and this door is linked to a Raspberry as well, so we, something could be done here. So I used the Open Lab app, which was called Sphincter at the time and started tinkering around with it. First time ever that I did anything with apps. And, well, as you can see in the screenshot, it was a bit more than just a button that, that you can click on. You can uh, configure various doors here, and you have various buttons, such as a doorbell. And, well, feature-wise, the whole thing kind of exploded because it was fun and I didn't only introduce support for calling a link in the background, you can communicate via SSH as well and <clears throat> submit a preset command and then I thought, okay, well, this kind of Bluetooth thing, I heard about that, so let's put that one into an MQTT, if you are into IoT, you know about that. Nuki Smart Lock, that is a separate story. Story. and I published the app on F-Droid, so when that happened, the thing was someone wrote me an email and said, hey, how about you supporting Nuki Smart Lock? And I said, oh, what's that? And I looked and realized, well, it is a commercial product, an electronic lock that um, you can just uh, mount onto the door lock, uh, around 200 euros, I think, but the protocol is open, so the corona started and I had some time left, so I thought, okay, let's implement this too. And the person that contacted me said, well, if you're interested in implementing this, I'll just send you one, a device via Amazon. So I received that package and thought, cool, a toy and went ahead and implemented it, and it works. So, in general, this is an app that you can use to communicate with various doors. You can select whether a link should be called or SSH should be run or whatever. Uh, you can see the status in the background here as you've seen in the slides before. Uh, you can put in your own photos as well. So feature-wise, there's quite a lot that is possible now. QR code, export, import. Um, so you can pass on the key to another instance of Trigger. And you see that there are many, many features. SSH keys can be created. Uh, HTTPS certificates can be pinned, uh, downloaded. Uh, our door system, which ran on the Raspberry Pi, had a nice HTTPS certificate, so browsers would consider it all green, but then the certificate expired and there was something wrong with the domain. So we had to insert a feature that ignored the host name check um, and uh, the expiration date as well. That check can be disabled. Not something you should normally do, but it was necessary. Um, so, this app now exists, and you can not just only 
Not only get it on GitHub, you have the link to my project there, but also on FDroid, and I published it on Google Play if uh, just to make that possible to certain people that cannot deal with FDroid, never heard about it, don't want it. So I published it on Google Play for a symbolic euro. Um, I believe if people want to get this through Google Play, they should suffer a bit as well. Right. So that is my open source story. Uh, this was about a year uh, in the making, including bug fixes. So if you need something like this for your space or for other rooms, maybe you can set up the peer system, the server using a server, some CGI scripts, or maybe through SSH. Uh, so trigger a door with a motor that way. So for that kind of thing, this app is intended. So that's it that I wanted to talk about, just to um, spread the word. And that got me into Android programming, and I learned something there. And I'm happy if I hear that people use my work or even translate it. I don't think I have any translations so far. I have to check that. So there is things to do still, but it works. Right. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. There are no questions in the pad apart the F from the F-Droid link. Oh, the F-Droid link. Yeah, well, just go to F-Droid and F-Droid org. It's in the pad now. All right. Thank you. That is community work. So will you continue with the Chaos sticker collection? Yeah, I can do that too. So um, let me just check how I can undo the sharing. Uh, I think that was it. And I'll just open my other slides now, like this. I can only see your old slide. The change wasn't, ah, how, do, what is it, how does it look now? Yes. Wonderful. All right. So that didn't work so well in the first time, the first time I tried. So with Corona, people have too much time on their hands. So this is another example of that. Uh, and I believe that we all know that uh, these sticker events feature many boxes full of stickers and you grab them all and put them up and, and, and stick them. And that's something I liked to do, as enjoyed doing too. But the problem, of course, is that these fantastic stickers are, then get lost. And you then wonder, well, what to do now? Should I print them myself? How do I get the um, files for that? And what I did there was to search for people using search engines. And I found a few links. And then I thought, well, who's the author here? Could I ask these people? Maybe there are more stickers around from them. And I did that, and I wrote to people, and uh, that gave me a, a, a heap of sticker templates. And I thought, OK, I wanted to share those as well. And therefore, I started a GitHub repo, put them all in there with a, a large virtual sticker box. And I did a few things around that as well, just to make these stickers findable, so I tagged them. I added information on the original authors, what the license is. Most, in most cases, it's CC0 or Creative Commons something. I think I'll switch to the next slide. Um, it <clears throat> actually summarizes what I've told already. So if you want these stickers, you can copy all this as much as you want. And you have can have a lot of fun there and hopefully in the next perhaps prevents a presence event you might be able to print some stickers yourself and, and bring them and share them there and maybe change them around, improve them somehow, or verschlimmbessern, as a favorite German word goes, which is making worse in the process of improving. 
So here is a picture of the repository. You can show web pages. You can include web pages there. And using JavaScript, I put something together here that makes you enter a word such as Freifunk or Chaos or Google, and you then get stickers for that. So these are mostly sticker templates, photos as well, or things I thought I like, but I, one that I would like to have, but didn't find the originals for. And uh, there is just a script that fills a JSON file, and you can um, see it on the page there. The project itself is on CC0, so you can do with that whatever you want. And I think that summarizes quite neatly. There are 400 stickers there, which is good. Uh, and it's nice to just try out the search slot there. And just have a rummage around, browse it, see some older stickers. These are all previews, but if you click on files, you can go to a folder that and a directory that has all the templates in various formats that you may repurpose, change colors or whatever. Uh, and of course, there's a lot to, to be done still. First of all, call to you if you have sticker originals or no anyone uh, uh, if you have bookmarks perhaps send them to me and I'll try to in incorporate them uh, just submit a merge request maybe uh, copy it for your own purposes the licenses for the images in case you want to use them are mostly CC0 or Creative Commons but some have no license information because I don't know. If you do know about a certain image, please let me know so I can add the information. And uh, so this is a call to all of you. And yeah, more stickers, please. That would be great. It would be great to surpass that 400 threshold. I think I'm just below that right now. So send me stuff, have fun, print, just use it for something. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The GitHub repository has now been entered in the pad. There are no further questions. But regarding your earlier talk, would you accept questions for that? Yes. So what is that Raspberry Pi solution for a door? Um, well, I think in my GitHub repo, repo for that trigger project, so github slash mwarning slash trigger, I think at the bottom there you have other projects that did something similar, which covers the server side as well. Uh, so you can find, so I have, you have lists for server side projects and click on that. Uh, you may be inspired there. There is some code that you could use to do it yourself or to install it yourself. I don't know how well these are documented, but that is a beginning. And uh, otherwise, it's just a case of running, uh, writing a shell script to trigger a certain pin on your Raspberry Pi. And that pin would then have to connect to the door mechanism. It's as simple as that. But of course, you, of course you have to set up the web server. And um, that is not something I looked into very deeply in my trigger project. But if you have server configurations, please do send me links there. And I'll happy to add the information so that people don't just get the app, but also get some advice on setting up the server side. Yeah. OK. Someone says, nice project. Where is it being used? Well, the thing is, people don't actually tell me. I, uh, they don't have to, so I don't know where it's being used. There are some stars on GitHub that people have given me 50 or 60, so I suspect that it is being used. I did hear from some people that they are using it, but I haven't got the detailed feedback, not a lot, but it's nice to hear if people use it. So again, I'd be happy to just be given a hello. We are using it in city XY or in this hack space. Uh, that is the kind of love that you can give to developers to tell them thank you and uh, your work is being used. It works. Or just forking it, merging requests. If you find a typo somewhere, 
um, if you want to implement a certain feature. For those that are more into Android programming, yeah, so that's what you could do. Okay. Regarding the stickers, we have a question now. Are the stickers available on Signal as well as Signal stickers? Well, the Signal stickers, I don't know Signal that well, so I don't know what stickers for Signal actually means, whether they use a for, uh, their own format. I, I have no idea. The answer, I guess, would have to be no. And there is a comment saying that the year of occurrence would be interesting as metadata. Oh, that is difficult to, to get that information. Um, I collected all these within two months, largely, uh, in retrospect, as it were. And the year of appearance, there is a lot of things that could be done in looking after the metadata there. Yes. and. Another bit of information, the Chaos Communication Congress does have a sticker group, um, and I was in touch with them, very nice. So hopefully they will be using some of my work, and um, I hope that they will be happy about that. Okay, thank you very much for your talks. So, on to the next one, photovoltaics. Are you there? Yes, yeah, great. There. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm here. Hello. So I have to activate my screen share first. Where's that again? Can you see it? Nothing yet? No, unfortunately not. Why not? Ah, of course. Silly me. Still nothing. So should we maybe skip ahead for now? So you can have a moment for testing to see how the sharing works. Or can we do something to help? Ah. Uh, now it works. Now we get it. You can see it? Yes, we can. So let me put it on full screen. I wanted to talk about freedom for photovoltaics, so solar power. At least more freedom. So solar power is something that is included in 100,000 rules and laws from the EU back down to Germany in this renewable energy law. And I am um, at home in Bavaria and apparently the German states have different ideas as well. And I just want to quickly explain my target and how I think we could get there and the difficulties I'm facing. So the situation is, of course, I have a small house and it has a roof. And apart from that, I have the normal infrastructure. I'm connect getting my power from the provider. But I also have solar thermal, a thermal um, um, parts on my roof, so I'm already using that. But yes, I'm, I wanted to learn more and suddenly things 
that weird. So if I try to include the power I'm producing into the infrastructure of the provider, then that if I'm connecting that, then that means that I potentially sell power. So if I'm not using all the power that I'm producing, it goes into the network, into the power grid. So in theory, uh, in practice, it actually only works, it only creates uh, AC power if it's connected to the grid because it has to synchronize. So as soon as I have no more power from the grid, the device, my device, completely turns off. So in that moment, when I really need the power, I'm not having any. And of course, it has to be said, if you are selling to the grid, you get money. And so the provider is then expecting the full control over everything that you're doing, how everything is installed, how much is installed, and all the interfaces, everything. And that's, it, that's where it gets difficult, because I think sun shines for everyone on this planet, and I should be allowed to use it as I see fit. So my goal would be... Yes, sorry, so the slides are still on the first slide. Could you see it? check if you could? Yeah, nope, I did. So something is wrong with the slides. We cannot see the progress. Okay, so now we are there, the goal. So full screen did not work out as it should. So I was talking about this, this slide, you couldn't see that? No. But, well, now we can. So yeah, we have the provider, the 800 liter storage for thermal solar. And as soon as I want to enter the grid, it gets difficult. And now I want to use my limited roof. It's not perfect for me. I have a southeast and northwest. And the roof is not flat at all, so I can't use it for much, but I want to do a little bit. And of course, I especially want what I already said. I want to use the solar power when the grid is, has a blackout, but that does not work. But because in that moment, when the grid drops out, the AC power from my system drops out as well. So I would need an element. Of course, it has to be certified. Some coupling that connects and also disconnects my power from the grid so that it can also function when the grid drops out. If I completely disconnect from the grid, I also want to be free from control. If I'm not selling anything, nobody has to control me. And of course, they uh, actually they say, yeah, that's possible, but the technology behind it does not exist. So my idea is that in the first step, I want a Geria uh, solar power element. It's a very small module. It can at most have about 600 watts of power. And then you do not have to register it. Then you do not have to take money if something goes into the grid and you do not have to pay taxes on it. So you can already use a bit of the power in your own house. Some computers on standby, maybe the fridge, if the sun is really shining, something like that. What I then need is a component that couples or disconnects from the grid, if the grid goes down, so I'm not taken down as well. So especially if there is a blackout, 
I still have power. And in the next moment, I of course want to add further components. I want a battery, I want further modules. And what I want is I want to use a lot of energy that's produced there. I want to use that for heating. So if the sun is shining and I'm not using much, much power, I want to fill up my 800 liter um, storage of water and I want to heat that up and I want to save that energy that way. Of course, this has further challenges. We need a counter that does not run backwards. So if I am giving power to the grid, then the, the old power counter, it runs backwards. But it must not be like that by law. So of course the provider, I have to talk to the provider and they have to build in uh, a data logger basically that does not run backwards, which adds further cost, but apparently it's not that expensive. What's more difficult, and I cannot find any information on that, no matter where I look or no, where, where I asked so far, that you have complete three phase power that can be completely disconnected, of course, certified and fully automated, ideally, if there is a blackout, that you only use your own power for your own house. And as soon as the power is back, it's synchronized again, and you can get power from the grid again. Such a solution would be necessary, and it's possible, it's, it's not witchcraft, but you cannot find something like that. It's not wanted. I am guessing it's lobbying people who keep that from happening, from entering the market. And that's bad, because we want to use our energy. And we want to use less energy from the big power plants. And it would be good to do that, and that's why I'm trying, and I would hope to find more help with this. So maybe there is one amongst you who has further ideas or could further this discussion with me. And if I could just start some ideas rolling in your heads, I already met one of my principal goals and this started in the last few days that I wanted to talk about this, because right now I'm having these problems. And yeah, so hopefully I met my goal and it's easy for you to reach me if you want the slides. I can make them available. If I told you something wrong, I really say sorry. It might be because this was a very spontaneous idea today. And that's it for me. Yes, thank you very much. In the internet was asking if they could get the slides, could they be uploaded or should they write you an email? Where could I upload it? I can do that, of course. I will I'll check. Um, I put in my email address, of course, and it's in the list, of course, on Mastodon, uh, also my Mastodon uh, account. And yeah, you can just talk to me and I will provide the slides. So, question. What about balcony power plant with smaller things. It should be easier from the administration. And yes, that is exactly the Greer plant I want to start with, with 600 watts tops. And sometimes on the paper it says 650 watts. And with the AC uh, converter, if you add that, you can have it on a balcony, on your garage, on your roof. 
like a normal power installation. So this thing is, from the bureaucracy, easier. So it's less work. It does not have to be included in this new list. And you will not get money if that provides power to the grid. So, of course, it's possible that some power that you don't use up yourself enters the grid, but you have to accept that. You have to accept that you're giving away the power. You're not getting paid for that. But of course, you don't have to do the more complex taxes and all the bureaucracy. Yeah, another question is, would a power supply completely from a small USV with uh, two supply, wouldn't that suffice? So a small USV, I am thinking about that sometimes, but that does not really work. It only works for a short time. When you think about it, so I, it would only run for a short time and a blackout would last longer. Uh, in English, it's UPS, uninterrupted power supply. And I thought about it. And of course, if it's implemented correctly, oh, uninterruptible power supply, sorry. So that would be included into in the normal grid within your house if it's implemented properly. And if I have it, so if I have a UPS, it doesn't matter where it comes from, from the provider or from my personal power uh, system. So it should work the same. Yeah, thank you very much. Got quite a few fans. So, the next talk. The destruction of the VVV. So, hi, I hope everything works. We can see you and hear you. Great. Uh, I want to talk about the destruction of the World Wide Web. Um, first of all, a small setup. I'm not a lawyer in any way, so this is not meant to be legal information. You should talk with your lawyer about that. Uh, the background of my talk is that privacy in the uh, private uh, gets more and more complicated and there is uh, should there, there will be a law that makes uh, that that ensures that are uh, no barriers for in the European Union for the internet websites and web shopping, for example. In more and more areas, companies think about how they can, uh, or how they did not prepare their offers without uh, without barriers, and they have to prepare to realize the new law. And everywhere there are, there's a new requirement. Many companies think about how to solve that, and many companies create pub automated testing to these requirements, the WCR requirements for accessible web content. It's a long list, and it basically doesn't finish, and it is, there are still ongoing development. Some criteria in these world uh, WC3C can be verified automatically. However, some are not verifiable automatically and that must be done ma manually. And unfortunately, that's quite expensive. And therefore, those are just a well developed suited development tool and developers can 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 check that and they see hey here there might be an accessibility pro issue and check whether that's really that's of course offered with uh, some touristical 
Yeah, not everything is can be done optimized, and therefore there are different companies and they try to connect these automated testing services with the uh, automated solving tries. There are uh, accessibility overlays, for example, this one. You can find it here. Accessibility. We can see it. And this is the website. And down here on the right hand side, you have this small accessibility icon. And if you open it, you get a list of of, of things you can do with XSB. For example, it's it's a long list and nobody can select it for every every website. And another issue is that several of these options are can be done via a mobile networks that are only CSS or JavaScript changes and where a, a accessible markup is used. There are a lot of options and many options can destroy something. For example, currently it's completely broken. Yes, it looks like this and um, that's the next step. These accessibility overlays usually destroy several things quickly. And that should not be uh, acceptable, but that's something the user can control. However, these, the companies that offer these services always talk about AI and offer screen reader support, keyboard navigation and all the other accessibility features that are required, but what they do is sometimes really bad because that way pages are completely unusable sometimes and lose all structure because that AI tool does not understand what happens on that website, what is offered and what the context is. Um, another interesting issue with XSB is that the, the tools require that you have a compliant site before you can include this tool and if they are legally required. There are a number of juristical uh, problems they have. There are a number of different offers uh, in the question page. There is an interesting blog post from by Adrian Roselli, who is an accessibility expert. And so look, look at all the issues and don't use those services, but sit down and look, it, look into accessibility if you need to update your services. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Put your put that into the pad and for Chaos Zone, the Inclusion Operation Center exists where you can get help if your Operation Center has questions about accessibility on the web. Great, there are no further questions, uh, so we will continue to the next talk. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello. Let's share the screen. So, Take digital politics seriously for once. I want to talk to you for five minutes and give you an overview over the formal structures of Hamburg. So let's begin. We got the executive, the legislative, and of course the judicative, but for us now it's not as relevant. 
von so the executive dem Bürgermeister Peter Tschentscher is und, headed uh, by the first mayor und and of course there are senators as well and each of them has their own office or the uh, so yeah he is heading them the German word is Senatskanzlei. So, yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So there is one guy who is responsible and if some other uh, department wants to do something with the digital works, they know who to talk to and they can just say, we want to make a project, we want to do something for the for civics and we want to adjust software. Everything is coordinated there. So that's not necessarily a bad idea that everything is in this uh, office. And there is someone who's actually competent, you might not believe it, but now the problem. And I have to talk about the legislative. So we have the Parliament and the Senate. And there is a, a plenum, of course, with a lot of smaller groups who work with topics of the EU or different specific subjects. So we could now think, well, Hamburg, there is quite a few um, universities or colleges uh, with computer science. So do we have one of those working groups talking about digital topics? So they could provide tools and have proper protocols where the Senate has to explain to the public what's happening after each meeting. Is everything running as expected? Just like all the other uh, working groups have it. And then this uh, committee, that's a pro proper word. So this committee could um, make suggestions and others, but we do not have that in Hamburg. So basically, there is no one in Parliament who talks about digital topics. There is an undercommittee, but that's very specific about spending. And it cannot talk about things on their own accord, but they have to be told what to talk about and what to investigate. And so it's very limited. So what options do we have for corrections for digital politics during this um, term? Well, there's not much we can do. Every five years there's a vote, there's an election. And since everything is directly dependent on the first mayor, it really depends on who leads the government. So who who makes decisions. And it's very difficult when you look at Hamburg since 1949 to expect a change in government. So it's very rare that not the SPD, the Social Democrats of Germany, were at the top. So since COVID, we know that it can happen that something happens within a term that you did not expect. And sometimes you really have to act quickly, even if it was not um, agreed upon right after the election. So what can we do? We have to work quickly with all parties so that all the parties agree and commit to publicly um, bring digital topics into the focus before the election 2025. And it has to be public and there has to be a lot of pressure uh, from the public. So we do not get just buzzwords, but real change. And that's already it. Yeah, there's my contact info and of course yeah. I'll put it into the pad. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Somebody is adding. So they are making the universe, so the university is shrinking down their computer science. 
which does not help, obvi uh, uh, obviously. Yeah, no questions for your talk. Let's continue with TBS. Your um, where is market? So, hast du schon meine Folien oder siehst du nur mich? So, so. Dich und schwarzen Hintergrund, aber keine. Can you see my slides? Um, I can see you in the black background, background, but no slides. But apparently, it only works with these slides. I can see the slides now. But they're loading. Um, yeah, no, great. Yes. Welcome to my short talk about where is market. A small project running through the last six years, and it's about farmers' market where you can get fruits and vegetables, but also flea markets and all other different types of markets you can remember. For example, the fish market in Hamburg, and. The project is a website where you can find markets in a city and it, the project answers two questions. Uh, first of all, where is the market and when is the market? And you can see these information on the map and you can select your town and city or your position. In Larger this, and then you can find the closest market. You can select now, today, and all markets, and the icons show you all the information, the address and the the, the time. And the day the market is, is operating. The data is from an open data project, usually from that city, and are just vis visualized on the map. Because on the website of the towns, it's usually an, a table or a PDF, and it's easier on a map. It all works on a smartphone, looks like this, and 79 towns are there now. So far it's a manual process, they had accepted and do the entry of their own town and care about it, because nothing is worse than old data in a year or there are differences in winter and summer. It should be a, a be, be, be extra, the updated. A number of people uh, help there, and you can also be involved. You live somewhere, you perhaps go to the market, and you can just take the data format, a small JSON file, and you enter the information and perhaps automize if you have the data from your town. And have an up to dating script. And that way you can enter the data, the, the information about your town. The GitHub repository has all the, the necessary information to participate. And not only writing new software and design, but you can also participate in the website itself. But you can only also only just add the data. It's also classified, easy if things, larger issues. And there is a participant guide, contribution guide, on how to add the data. You have to create three files, uh, something about the town, 
Ja, und read me file. Feedback, wenn man was hinzufügt, dann werden die Daten überprüft. Ja, You will get feedback if you add something. The files are analyzed. You can try it on GitHub here. And you see whether it, everything is fine. And I will get in touch with you or somebody else if whether everything is working. So this is an invitation to participate. It's all open source. You will find it on GitHub. And there are a couple of different. Uh, you can probably see me. There is this beautiful t shirt you can create yourself. Or, uh, there is a vector graphics on the GitHub, but you can even get a sticker like this. They, I had 5,000 printed, but there are still a couple left, so call me and I will send them to you. Or you print your own, the, uh, everything is available. I saw that there are questions in the pad and I tried to answer them. Um, the question for OpenStreetMap and an integration into OpenStreetMap, we tried that, uh, we discussed it before, but nobody worked at that. It would be great to have the data, not only in this project, but to update that with OpenStreetMap and check whether they are working together and how to update them. That also helps to have more cities involved. And the other question is uh, about usability. Can you create a town with a city with several cities included in one because of um, that's also something we worked on. Uh, there is a, a pull request for that or a branch. Yeah. And finally, yeah, nobody did it so far. So this, we need partners for the different towns. So if you want to uh, add the data of your town, you're welcome to. And there are a couple of, of, of code improvements possible. Yes. You're welcome to, to participate. I think there is another question. Yes. Thank you for your talk and for answering all the questions. But we have to finish now. Um, all presenters are invited to wave to the camera if you want to. And thank you for the presentations. And thank you for the viewers and all of your questions. There is a short break, and at quarter past four, there is a talk about critical infrastructures by Honkhauser. Have a great divo.